right, good morning everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm really excited when people come out to talk about trauma and culture. Um, so the fact that you're here shows me that this is something that's really important to you. Um, I want to start by telling you a little bit about our center. So we are a category three trauma training and services center. We're federally funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And we're also members of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which means we have a ton of resources around this type of topic. So a lot of our content you'll see today is from NCTSN and SAMHSA. Um, so my role on our grant, um, or we have two grants, one of my roles is to do training around trauma-informed care across different systems. So we've had the pleasure of working with pediatricians, school personnel, law enforcement around developmental impact of trauma. And then we also have a second grant, which is a mental health awareness training grant, which allows us to really focus in on communities in the Burlington County area. And we've been able to train some folks in Question, Persuade, and Refer, which is a youth suicide prevention program, and youth mental health first aid. Again, in that community, it's interdisciplinary. So we've been able to work with law enforcement, school personnel, faith communities are inviting us in their places of worship to talk about this stuff. So it's really exciting work. Um, today, we are going to talk about the intersection of culture and trauma. Okay, and how that impacts the way that people, um, how their symptoms present, but also um, how it impacts their willingness to seek help and support. Uh, but before we get started, there are a lot of people in the room. I want to get a sense of who's here, but we may not be able to introduce each person. Um, so can you raise your hand if you're a clinician? Okay. Raise your hand if you are a medical doctor. Okay. Uh, and I saw a few doctor level psychology interns here as well. Okay. Anyone else want to shout out what they do? Training. <laughs> training. Training cons consultation. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, I think I'm supposed to be at the podium, so I'm going to move that way. <laughs> All right. So our goals for today are to talk about trauma-informed care. So we are going to do a little trauma 101 and talk about uh, what trauma looks like, how it shows up in the people that we work with. Uh, we're going to talk about how early exposure to trauma and toxic stress impacts our families and the children that we're working with. But we're going to talk about that intersection of culture and trauma as well because um, it really impacts the way that people show up in, our, in their interactions with us. And culture also impacts the way that people perceive traumatic experiences. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and then we're going to talk about how your own stress impacts the work that you do and how we show up in our interactions with our consumers and families. All right, so what is a potentially traumatic event? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual identifies trauma as um, an exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violation. But um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration identifies three key components to what um, could be a traumatic event. So they are what we call the three E's. Experiences, I'm sorry, events, experiences, and effects. So that basically means that first there has to be something that happens in the environment. Either it's happening to that person directly, or they're witnessing it in their environment, or they've heard that something's happened to someone they love and care about. Or in this day and age, it can even be that they witness it through media. You know, it could be miles and miles away from where they, act, they are actually living, but it's frightening and they gain exposure to it. Uh, the second piece is really important, and that, that, that's experiences. So the reason why this part is important is because we want to remember that trauma is subjective. The way that people process it and experience it is very subjective. What may overwhelm the capacity of someone who's five? may not overwhelm the capacity of someone who's 16. So often we find ourselves working with families where you know the entire family system has had this collective, this shared experience, and everyone's responding differently. Everyone internalized things differently. So we have to remember that the nature of trauma is very subjective. And then the last piece is effects. This piece can be subjective as well because the way that people respond or um, are impacted by their trauma is very different and, it, and a lot of factors come into play. Um, age, um, the type of trauma exposure, um, the kind of internal resources they had before the trauma and external resources. So those are the three main components of, um, of trauma and how it shows up. So we're going to look at different forms of trauma. Um, the things that are bolded, I would say, are things that are being talked about a little bit more um, in recent years. So things like community violence. Um, this was a big one. This came up when there was a study. There was a study done in one of the school-based programs in Newark 
where um, there was this approach to doing trauma-informed care that kind of covered every aspect. We did trauma-informed care training with the staff. Uh, we did some training with um, the clinicians who were working directly with the children, and there was some screening of the children who were being referred out of class due to behavioral problems and aggression. And what they found is that a lot of the youth were, um, once they were screen screened with the trauma symptom checklist, were coming up very high, not on aggression, but on anxiety. Um, and when the clinicians were talking to them a little bit more deeply, it turns out that they were with a lot of community violence. They were coming in really hyper vigilant because the route to school wasn't safe. You know, all these things were coming up for the young people that we were working with. Another thing that's been talked about a lot lately is either loss of a stable caregiver or inconsistent home placements. Um, vicarious trauma, that's kind of all of us and <laughs> the work that we're doing. Um, if we're not careful, if we don't make sure we have the appropriate supports inside and outside of work, we can be impacted by the work that we're doing. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later about historical trauma, these, you know, kind of group experiences like um, the internment of Japanese Americans, uh, the Holocaust, slavery of African Americans, treatment of Native Americans. We're going to talk a little bit about how these experiences impact people several generations later, even though they weren't there for that direct experience. Um, and then there's complex trauma, the thinking that sometimes, unfortunately, the folks that we work with are experiencing a number of these things, a combination of these things even, um, and how that impacts the way that they function. All right, so the types of responses we have to trauma, uh, especially in working with children, tend to be behavioral, right? Because developmentally, they're not always in a space where they're able to articulate what's happened to them. They're not able to tell their story, or they may not have the emotional language to share with us what they feel or even what they need. So a lot of the times we see what's going on, they let us know by showing us that something just doesn't feel right. The other piece uh, is emotional responses. We see that our children are struggling to regulate themselves, um, to soothe themselves, to express their emotions, and to ask for help. Uh, and then we see cognitive impact. So we're seeing young people who are struggling with um, thinking clearly, concentrating, uh, being able to anticipate consequences. They're even struggling with their thoughts about themselves, other people, and the world at large. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit of, about trauma responses by age, but before we enter this territory, I just want to say that whenever we talk about trauma, it can be emotionally heavy. So um, I wanted to ask a few things of you all as we move through this, um, this talk today. First, I want to ask you just to self-monitor, you know, kind of take care of yourself throughout this presentation. If you notice that any of the content or the videos that we're going to watch in a little bit are just, you know, a little bit too much, you need a break, it is okay to take a step out. I just ask that you come back. <laughs> if you can. Um, and then, you know, I'd also ask you to, to take care of one another. If you notice that, you know, when you return to your respective departments, one of your coworkers seeing that they're still thinking about this or it, it still seems to be weighing heavy on them, be okay with checking in with them. And then the last piece, I ask that you be open. Um, open to having some conversation around culture and trauma, um, open to learning from one another, um, but also open to the idea that sometimes um, these necessary conversations are a little uncomfortable. So be comfortable with discomfort um, is, is what I'm asking. Okay. So NCTSN identifies a few kind of common uh, responses to trauma by age. Um, in the preschool age range, we may see a lot of regression around um, toileting. We may see regression around language. We may see um, dysregulation of emotions um, and recreating their trauma through their play and interactions. I have to say, when I did outpatient work, one of the most challenging cases I had was a three-year-old who had been referred by DCPMP because of a history of trauma. And it was challenging for a lot of reasons. She was very dysregulated. Uh, when I came to pick her up, I would kind of warn the clinicians in the clinic, I'm going to get so-and-so. Everyone would close their doors because she, when she hit the floor, when she hit our main floor, she would kind of run in and out of people's offices and take things. And she was very dysregulated, very hypervigilant. But then also her play was very, very difficult to kind of hold and manage. So again, because they don't have the language, we're going to see a lot of what they've experienced through the play and also through their behavior. Uh, in the elementary school age range, we see them becoming increasingly fearful. Um, so this is when a lot of our kids may um, be school avoidant because they're afraid of leaving home. They're not sure if they leave, if things will be in an okay state when they return. Um, they are struggling with uh, leaving their caregivers. They are struggling with feelings of shame and guilt that seem unwarranted. Uh, but all these things are possibilities. They may also struggle with sleep and eating, uh, maintaining an appropriate weight. 
And then by the time they get to high school, we're seeing that they're, if, they're, if they have not had the opportunity to process and work through their trauma, we're seeing that they may struggle with feelings of isolation and depression. Um, they may start to experiment with, with substance use, uh, may start to become sexually active or engage in um, unsafe sexual practices, have sleep disturbances, may seem irritable. Um, all of these things are possibilities if they're not getting the appropriate treatment. All right, so we're going to talk about trauma and brain development a little bit. I promise not to get too brainy, um, but what we're noticing is that um, studies have been done. This particular study was done by the Department of Health, and they looked at the brains of people who have been impacted by complex trauma. And what they learned is that there are several areas of the brain that, that changed as a result of their experiences. So their bodies were really kind of keeping the score and, and, and um, kind of storing their, their emotional experiences. So the hippocampus was um, reduced in volume, and that's really um, central to our ability to learn and um, our memory. We saw that the corpus callosum, which is responsible for communication between the right and left hemisphere, was impacted. Um, and that area is really important for communication and arousal and emotion and kind of managing all that kind of stuff. Um, the cerebellum, which is known for really helping us out with motor functioning, was impacted. Um, and the prefrontal cortex, which is essentially what we all need to kind of be successful functional adults, was significantly impacted as well. They, they kind of nicknamed the prefrontal cortex the, the seed of humanity because it's kind of what differentiates us from the other animals. You know, it gives us our ability to feel empathy, um, to anticipate consequences, to think about thinking. Um, so that was significantly impacted. And then the amygdala, which is responsible for our emotional reactions and storing emotional memories, was also um, viewed as overactive. So this means that these young people were kind of scanning their environments more and anticipating threat even when it didn't exist. Uh, so all of this stuff was found in that particular study. So what is trauma-informed care, right? So how do we kind of take this stuff that we know or take this stuff that we're learning and apply it to the work that we're doing? Um, trauma-informed care really involves two components. It involves having a system and a clinician that really understand and get the work. So at the system level, it's about recognizing the widespread impact of trauma, um, and making sure that we're, in, we're incorporating that knowledge that we have into our policies and practices and procedures um, and really just creating an organizational culture that supports this type of work. Um, on the clinician level, it means that the clinician has an awareness of how trauma impacts people in every domain of their life, um, but also a willingness to assess for it. Um, sometimes when we've entered the school setting in particular, um, educators will tell us, well, this isn't what we do. You know, if I ask these questions, then what? You know, what does that mean? And what I like to say is, you know, it, it's kind of trauma and I would say culture are, are kind of like the elephant in the room. Those are two things that are always there and always impacting the way that we interact with the world around us, regardless of whether we talk about them or not. So we might as well, you know, kind of put it out there and, and address it so we see real improvement. So the other piece is that um, clinicians should be trying to cultivate an environment that feels safe, that feels welcoming, um, where people are open to talking about their experiences. And lastly, it's important not only to educate our families. We, we want them to have a frame of reference and understand what they've been through, that it's not okay, and how they could potentially be impacted if they don't engage in treatment. But what's more important is that we educate them about resilience and recovery and the fact that they can recreate, they can recreate a life, they can kind of define and make a life that feels meaningful and worth living for themselves following these types of events. So there are several components of um, a trauma-informed system. The first is screening and assessment. We want to be able to have some measures that, that help us see where people are when they enter, that help us identify what's going on with them so that we get a fuller picture. Uh, screening and assessment, I think, is important for a few reasons. I think one is that it's an objective way to say, here's what we're dealing with. Um, and whenever we use objective measures, it's easier to communicate across systems. I can easily tell the DCP and P worker, well, um, the symptoms of anxiety or symptoms of um, avoidance and intrusion, intrusion were at this level, but now near the end of treatment, we're here, and this is my grounds for termination. You know, so it's easier to communicate across systems when we have those objective measures. Um, the other piece is that it's destigmatizing. When folks come in to meet with us, if we have a measure that kind of captures their experience, they're thinking, wow, you know, 
this is something that not only I'm going through, but other people must be going through because there's something created specifically for me. We also want to be able to have evidence-based treatment options, so um, either promising practices or things that have been proven to be effective in decreasing symptoms for uh, the populations we're working with. Uh, we also want to have informed an informed workforce at every level. So this piece means a lot to me because I do a lot of training, again, across disciplines, working with folks who maybe have no exposure sometimes to, um, to clinical content. This is important because I think that we sometimes forget that um, Folks who are working security, folks who are checking people in, they are the introduction to our agency. They are the first line, they're, they're kind of giving, they're establishing that very first relationship with the, the families that we're working with. So it's important that all of us at every level have some knowledge of um, trauma-informed care. What does that look like? How do I communicate in a way that doesn't um, make people feel uncomfortable or frightened? Or how do I make people feel welcomed? So when we've been training in our schools, a lot of the suggestions coming from the school staff is, oh, you should do this QPR training or youth mental health first aid training for the lunch staff or for the, you know, the janitorial staff because the kids really talk to them. You know, they, they see things that we don't see because they see them in an unstructured environment. So we want to be thinking about training everyone at every level. Um, Self-care, of course, is important um, and a valuable part of having a trauma-informed system. And that's because we are the, the most valuable tool we have. You know, the only thing that's consistent in every interaction we have with any family is that we're present. So we want to make sure that we're at our best um, and we're taking care of ourselves so that we can support the families. And then lastly, collaboration and feedback. We want to make sure, the only way I think we can make sure that what we're doing is effective in helping families is to hear from families what works and what doesn't. So um, constantly within your respective departments, you should be doing some assessments, some satisfaction surveys, some, you know, having suggestion boxes, anything you can have to get the voice of the people that you're working with so that they feel heard. And then uh, over time, they start to see some of their recommendations being put into place. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about adverse childhood experiences. I'm sure many of you are familiar, but we're gonna talk about a few different aspects of it. So the original study was done in 1998 by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente uh, with about 17,000 adults. Um, and they, they asked these questions. This was in a primary care setting. They wanted to get a sense of what's going on. You know, we're treating all these folks. We want to know what's happening um, and what, for them internally. So they asked 10 questions about physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. They asked about emotional neglect. They asked about um, mental illness, incarceration. Um, any violence, exposure to domestic violence, all of the things that can happen in childhood that can be um, really traumatic. They asked about these things in that ACEs study. Alright, so the demographics, what we found is that the, the study was predominantly female, but it was pretty close. Um, it was predominantly a Caucasian sample, um, middle class, college educated, uh, but there was some diversity there. All right, so what they found is that 64% of the sample uh, reported at least one ACE, so one adverse childhood experience. So that tells us that ACEs are pretty common. Um, they also found that 40% 40 40 reported two or more ACEs, and then 12% reported four or more ACEs. So the reason why this is important is because there was a correlation found. So we can't, we can't suggest causality, but there was correlation between the number of ACEs reported and physical health. So what they found is that if a person reported four or more ACEs, they were more likely to experience uh, COPD, any form of cancer, a history of depression, a history of suicide attempt, um, heart problems, basically the leading causes of death in the U.S. is what they were more likely to experience if they reported four or more ACEs. Um, if they reported six or more ACEs, they were likely to experience a 20-year decrease on their life expectancy. Okay. So this is the ACE pyramid, um, and you know we we identify it as a groundbreaking study because we know that ACEs are really important. But also, what they highlighted is that it's not just about the ACEs. What about all the stuff that happened before these traumatic events occurred? So they're also looking at historical trauma. 
Um, they're also looking at social conditions, systemic issues, right? Because these are kind of rooted and impact the experience. And then we're looking at the ACEs and how that leads up to those other things. So um, all those things can potentially lead to disruptions around neurological development, issues around social, emotional, and cognitive functioning, um, adoption of health risk behaviors, um, doing some risky things, um, disease and disability, and again, um, the experience of early death, a 20 year decrease. They were also able to connect the adverse experiences to a host of other things, um, to burns, fractures, traumatic brain injury, um, to depression, anxiety, suicide, PTSD, um, to unintended pregnancies, um, issues with uh, throughout the pregnancy, and also fetal death. Uh, they were connecting it to STDs and HIV, which I think is uh, related to having riskier behavior. Um, cancer, diabetes, alcohol, and then um, issues around opportunities, access to education, access to oc different occupations or earning potential, um, and then income. All right, so we've talked a lot about some of the stressors that came up in the ACEs. I'm wondering what are some of the stressors that come up for the families you all are working with and, and how does it impact the work? Poverty. Divorce. Access to support. Access to health care. Yeah, these things come up and I think that it really impacts people's ability to engage in, in therapy in a meaningful way because um, if they're worried about shelter, if they're worried about food, how present can they be in a session, right? Um, so these are things for us to really think about and I think that our role as clinicians really has shifted, right, over the years. We used to be kind of in this role where we're doing the work in the office but now we're being pushed to do the work as an advocate and do the work in the community and make sure they have the things they need the basic needs so that they can engage meaningfully and, and grow in therapy so these are some of the things you all mentioned um, having the economic hardship um, exposure to community violence it is really difficult to work with someone and help them to feel safe and trust themselves when they return to an environment that's unpredictable in their community um, thinking about child fair and uh, um, child fair welfare involvement um, again it's difficult to create that predictability that's taken away when you experience trauma if housing isn't predictable you know if the family that they're living with isn't predictable uh, we see housing issues many of our families are living in homes that are not up to code um, where they're being exposed to lead and things like that so all of these things really um, are impacting our families so one of the criticisms of the original ACEs study, it was criticized for, for a lack of diversity because it was um, primarily Caucasian, middle class, um, college educated. So they, they replicated the study in Philadelphia um, with a much smaller sample. They had 1,784 participants, um, predominantly female, but also pretty close, predominantly white and black, but some diversity in other areas as well. Um, what they found is that the rates for each ACE had increased, okay? So in the original study, 28% reported physical abuse and the Philadelphia study, 35% reported. Um, so all of those numbers are significantly higher. We went from 10% for emotional abuse to 33%, 19% um, for mental illness to 24%, uh, 26% for substance abuse to 35%, and then 4% for incarceration and 13% in um, Philadelphia. What they also found is that in the original ACEs study, uh, the participants were, 17% of the participants were likely to report four or more ACEs, but in the Philadelphia study, 40% were likely to report four or more ACEs. Um, in this particular study, they also added some other indicators. So they had the original set of questions, but then they also added in questions around, um, do you feel safe in your community? Have you seen community violence? Um, have you been bullied? Have you had any experiences of discrimination that you feel were related to your race or ethnicity? Um, so they added in those questions as well. So what we're starting to see, this is kind of the pictures coming together that if we're only looking at adverse childhood experiences, we're not capturing the full picture. We also have to be considering 
adverse community environments because we're working with these families that are rooted in these environments where there are systemic issues. So not only are we trying to capture and address, you know, history of depression, exposure to domestic violence, incarceration, mental illness, we're also trying to look at issues of poverty, discrimination, um, a community that is in, um, is in upset lack of legal um, opportunity and economic mobility, poor housing, violence, all of these things are really a part of um, the full picture. So the urban hassle scale was created to really um, dig deeper into that experience that folks are having, having in urban communities. Uh, what's interesting is that I think it was created originally in 1998 and then it were, was revised in 2005 to um, include an indicator for how they perceive the experience. So you have questions, this is not all of them, but you have questions like, um, do you have to take a different route home to stay safe? Um, do you feel pressured to carry a weapon for protection? Um, do you fear about, you know, do you keep your fear about safety a secret from your friends? So that's the other thing that comes up. A lot of our kids are fearful of living in the neighborhood they're in, but they don't want to appear weak. So they don't tell their friends, they don't tell their caregivers. Um, there's a lot of pressure to really, um, to be stoic and to kind of keep moving. So what they found in this study is that um, a youth could have reported that they experienced these things, but if they perceived it as not impacting them or impacting them very little, they um, were functioning better. If they reported that they had experienced these things, but it impacted them a lot, they were functioning um, at, at a level that wasn't helpful or healthy for them. They also, they also found that the more likely, so if a person reported that they were very much impacted by these experiences, they were more likely to struggle academically, they were more likely to struggle with feelings around their self-esteem, um, all of those things that, that kind of come up when we look at our children, their ability to excel academically. So we also are going to look at ACEs in New Jersey. So this is a new, relatively new study. In 2019, um, an ACEs report was released in New Jersey where we learned that 40% of our children um, ha are reporting having at least one ACE, one adverse experience. Um, so that's sev around 782,000 children. 18% um, are reporting that they've experienced multiple ACEs, so more than one. Um, and what we know is that rates of exposure for ACEs in New Jersey are higher for children of color. Um, so I'm wondering, given what we've talked about so far, if you all have any thoughts around um, why our children of color or our children in urban communities are experiencing higher rates of ACEs. Cycles of abuse? I'm sorry. Like cycles of abuse? Right, right. So that, that's something you're touching on intergenerational trauma, right? So that something is happening and these experiences are being shared across generations and, and impacting um, parenting. Mm -hmm. yes. Limited culturally diverse resources. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. Yes. So like systematic oppression. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's kind of what we were touching on in the previous slide with our tree that, you know, we, we can address all of these issues that they're presenting within the office, but if we don't get to what's happening in the community, we're, we're going to see that revolving door where we're kind of treating um, this child and then we're treating their child when they come in a few years later. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, intergenerational trauma. So in the beginning, we talked about historical trauma, these experiences. Sorry, but that was my slide. <laughs> um, we talked about these experiences that you know cultures kind of share, um, but intergenerational trauma is the idea that some of these things are transmitted from ge one generation to the next, even though we're not directly experiencing them today. It impacts the way that we interact with one another, the way that we love in our families, the way that we communicate, and it impacts the way that people show up. 59-year-old Karen Sonneberg grew up on the North Shore of Long Island, just an hour's drive from New York City. Her parents survived the Holocaust, but rarely mentioned it. All I knew was that we were different, that I was different. I didn't exactly know why. Her parents were Jewish, born in Germany. But after Hitler came to power, their families fled. Sonneberg's parents were just children, but carried the traumas of Nazi oppression throughout their lives. My mother, from the time she was three on, from my father, from the time he was five or six years old, yeah. he was subjected to the um, painful existence in Germany. 
Despite her own comfortable upbringing here in the U.S., Sonneberg privately struggled for years with anxiety and stress. And while she couldn't prove it, she believed it was somehow linked to her parents' traumatic childhoods. Having discussed this with many of my friends who come from similar backgrounds, it seems to be consistent in most of us. There were definitely challenges that quote-unquote American kids didn't seem to have experienced. Even though you weren't there. Exactly. That's the amazing part of it. Now, a new study published this month in the scientific journal Biological Psychiatry bolsters Sonneberg's belief that she experienced the after-effects of her parents' trauma. Dr. Rachel Yehuda, director of Mount Sinai's Traumatic Stress Studies Division, led the study. Her team interviewed and drew blood from 32 sets of survivors and their children, focusing on a gene called FKBP5. We already know that this is a gene that contributes to risk for depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Yehuda noticed a pattern among the Holocaust survivors called an epigenetic change. Not a change in the gene itself, but rather a change in a chemical marker attached to it. When we looked at their own children, their children also had an epigenetic change in the same spot on the stress-related gene. What does that suggest? Well, in the first generation, in the Holocaust survivor, it suggests that there has been an adaptation or a response to a horrendous environmental event. And in the second generation, it suggests that there has also been a response of the offspring to this parental trauma. Which means children of Holocaust survivors, like Sonneberg, could be more likely to develop stress or anxiety disorders. Though their study was small, Yehuda and her team controlled for any early trauma the survivor's children may have experienced themselves. How is it that a parent who was subjected to the trauma of the Holocaust is able to somehow transmit that to a child who wasn't there? Well, that's a really good question. And this study that we did doesn't address the how. The study that we did just provides a proof of concept that um, we might be able to identify the how if we do more research. DNA is passed from parents to children. But research like Yehuda's suggests parental life experiences can modify their body chemistry, and those modifications can be transmitted to children as well. Scientists have examined this idea before. After a famine in Holland during 1944 and 45, children were born with the effects of malnutrition two generations after the food shortage ended. Previously, Yehuda herself studied stress hormone levels in children born to women who survived the September 11th terrorist attacks. She's been examining the link between trauma experienced by Holocaust survivors and their children for more than 20 years. A trauma is an event that changes you, and it doesn't have to change you for the negative. Trauma changes you in lots of different ways, but most people who experience extreme trauma learn a great deal from that experience and some of those lessons may be lessons that are transmitted to the child and that's not a bad thing. Yehuda says the implications aren't limited to Holocaust survivors but this dwindling population provides insight into how clinicians understand and treat stress disorders. If you're at risk for heart disease a lot of times a doctor can separate out, well, this is your weight, that's not good, this is your diet, these are your genetic risks, and things like that. And it would be very nice if we could develop a similar risk profile in the mental health arena, where we would be able to understand where the risk factors come from for depression and anxiety. We're on the 10th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. There were children who were born after that trauma. There are children born in the trauma of a, a war in Syria and other crises around the world. If you're the child of a parent who experienced trauma, are you doomed to be depressed or stressed for the rest of your life? I don't think you're doomed, but I think that many children of traumatized parents have struggled with depression and anxiety. And I can tell you that many of them have felt relieved that um, there might be a contributing factor that has been based on how they're responding to their parental trauma. I think that it's helped people work through a lot of that depression and anxiety.
Relief is exactly what Karen Sonneberg, the child of Holocaust survivors, felt after she participated in one of Dr. Yehuda's trauma survivor studies. She lost her mother 30 years ago, but looks forward to her father's 90th birthday next year. I've learned to cope in my life. I've learned to move on and get over all of this. Had I known at the time mm -hmm. how my reactions could impact future children, my children's reactions, I might have dealt with things differently um, or gotten them some sort of treatment that maybe would help them in the future. Yeah, and sometimes the, the transmission is very subtle. Um, you know, they say research is me search. So whenever I learn something new, I look at my family. <laughs> I try to say, you know, do I see this anywhere? Um, but I started thinking about my grandfather. He um, grew up in the South and came to the North and was very successful. He was a fireman. He was a police officer. Um, he retired as a longshoresman and owned several properties in our area. In the home he lived in, he boarded up the front door. And we never understood why. Why are there so many locks on the front door, Grandpa? There were literally locks from the floor to the top. You could not use the sun porch um, or enter the house in that way. Um, and so, you know, recently I asked my mom about that. I said, why do you have all those locks? And she laughed and, and told me about a story of the biggest fight they had, she ever had with her dad. Um, and that was because when I was born, she had a photographer come to his house to take pictures and she opened the front door. Um, and he kind of lost it. He said, I was never able to use anybody's front door, so no one's going to use mine. And I hadn't thought about that, you know, we just kind of said, Grandpa is, <laughs> you know, so, something's going on with Grandpa. Why, why are there so many locks? Um, but then thinking about it and just how it, it has meaning for me, I don't like people standing in front of my house. I don't sit on my porch. I always say, everybody in the back. It makes me uncomfortable. I feel like there's too many eyes on the house if some of us are in the front of the house when I think about it, my neighbors sit on their porch, they have rockers, you know, um, people hang out in front of their houses and nothing happens to them, but I don't want that at my house. So sometimes that transmission can be very subtle and we don't think about it, but when we become aware, it makes a lot of sense. There's a kind of a fundamental basis for post-traumatic slave syndrome. How many of you are familiar with post-traumatic stress disorder? But when we start talking about shadow slavery, we're not talking about one trauma. We're not talking about a specific event. We're talking about generations of trauma with no intervention. Based on what I know about sugar plantations, tobacco, and the Caribbean, what I know about American chattel slavery and the plantations there, does anyone right now ever recall mental health assistance to slaves? Anybody remember sending in the therapist after I sold off your son, daughter, raped folks? Any, in, at any point. Never. Second question. After slavery was officially over, now you're free. Anybody in remember, remember any therapy then? We know it's been rough, it's been deep for you, it's been difficult, we're going to do a little group therapy. Anybody remember that? That would be no. Number three, after slavery officially ended, both in the States, in the Caribbean, the British, in the, do you remember whether or not trauma continued? Did the trauma continue for people of African descent? I need to know. Okay, so now let's do the math. Hundreds of years of trauma, no treatment. Freed, more trauma, no treatment. What do you do the math? Do you think there may be residual impacts of that trauma? Of course there is. It didn't end, friends, and it hasn't ended yet. So I think one, on one point, African people and people of African descent are extremely resilient. Matter of fact, I think we're a miracle. Far be it for us to pathologize or to look and cast this idea of weak and sick people. Or on the contrary, we are I'm profoundly resilient. Because we've done everything we've done thus far with no help. With not even the ability to have this discussion. As though it were possible we escaped injury in all those hundreds of years. And the years that followed. So this, this kind of journey I'm going to take you on is going to be one that really gives a perspective on what this trauma was. What it looks like. And clinically, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? What does it look like? 
Now, let me give you a little snapshot. We'll get into it in more depth a little later. The post-traumatic stress disorder, if in fact you are diagnosed with that, again, remember, direct or indirect trauma, here are some of the symptoms. A feeling of foreshortened future. Now, what does that mean? A feeling, well, you're not going to live long. How many of you are running into young people that don't believe they're going to make it past their 20s? Feeling of foreshortened future. Exaggerated startle response. Outbursts of anger. Difficulty falling or staying asleep. Hypervigilance. Right? These are symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. This is like DSM stuff, Diagnostic Statistical Manual Mental Disorders. It's in there. And there's a whole listing of all these symptoms. Now, I want to roll it back so you can understand what, I, what the transmission theory is, because I'm going to talk about transmission. So how does a person that's been traumatized by post-traumatic, literally has a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, and can we, if we are logical and we are reasonable people, assume that a fair number of Africans had to have had post-traumatic stress disorder? You think? I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about them. Untreated, though, right? Okay, so now let's do the math. Mom, who saw dad sold or sister raped, has post-traumatic stress disorder. Still mom, though, right? Only mom now has outbursts of anger, feeling of foreshortened future, difficulty falling or staying asleep, hypervigilance. That would be mom. Now, Johnny, or Mary or Shaquisha, does not have, did not have the original trauma. But what are they learning? This is called social learning theory. What am I normalizing? Exaggerated startle response. Outbursts of anger. Do, are you following me? So I didn't have to be traumatized. Now the other thing is, do you think Johnny and Mary got traumatized too? Do you see? So what happens in your environment, you learn from the significant others in your environment. And if they're broken, guess what you're going to be? You're learning from broken people. And you're normalizing that behavior. And then it becomes, years later, 2008, that's their culture. And the collaboration across systems is key um, because we can't do it alone, right? We all need each other. And, you know, when you talk about impact, I'm thinking about, you know, the fact that children of color are more likely to experience harsh punishment in schools, even when they're displaying the same behavior as their counterparts. They're more likely to have an SRO called and it results in, you know, judicial uh, proceedings. They're more likely, um, they're making up more percentages in the, in the um, juvenile justice system. So we know all these things are happening. How do we partner across systems and, and, and make changes? So I don't have all the answers, but I have some thoughts about that um, that I hope to share with you all. We can think about a little bit more. Um, did anyone else have responses to Dr. Leary? All right. So one of the things that comes up is that, you know, you all are touching on this, that unintentionally, sometimes our systems um, create further trauma. You know, we kind of re-traumatize the, the people that we're working with. Um, and what we want to do is think about ways to avoid that. So SAMHSA came up with the four R's, okay? They're realize, recognize, uh, respond and resist re-traumatization. So we want to be able as an organization, as our, you know, in our own departments to realize the widespread impact of trauma. That, you know, it's likely that a lot of the people that we're working with are impacted by trauma. When we've done similar trainings with uh, pediatricians, I, I say universal precautions because we all kind of are told, taught that about bloodborne pathogens. Think about it in the same way. We need to operate in a way where we're looking for this information and asking about it because it's likely that it's there. Um, we want to also recognize um, how it's impacted them in every area of life, how it impacts the way that they interact, that they hear recommendations. Uh, we want to respond by making sure that our policies, procedures, um, everything, protocols are reflective and respectful of people's uh, respective identities and resist, actively resist re-traumatization. So, an example of that, of that is when Dr. Kelly Moore and I did um, some supervision or some shadowing in um, the ho university hospital. We went around and did rounds in the pediatric wing for children who were, you know, having some serious illness. And one of the things we noticed is that there was a knock on the door, but we all walked in. It was, good morning, and then there's 20 people in front of your bed. 
I was like, what was that? You know, we, we should knock and wait for an answer. <laughs> we should knock and ask, is it okay that I come in with my friends, you know? Um, so we did some shadowing and talked about how, you know, this could be very uncomfortable. So as we're walking, they're making the changes, and by the third room, they were knocking and asking, but then they were standing over the bed, and the, ch the child is laying in the bed. So we talked about take a seat next to the bed, you know. These are the, the little things that we can do to um, really equal, make the playing feel more equal and, and help people to feel safe. So those are the four R's. Um, I think when we talk about system-induced trauma, one of the other things we're trying to do is restore people's faith in the unwritten social contract, right? There's this belief that the sis there are systems created to protect us all, we hope, right? That the education system, the medical and mental health system, um, the, you know, justice system, all these systems are created to keep communities and people safe, but unfortunately there are some communities that don't believe in them. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about restoring people's faith and, and help, helping them feel welcome um, and open to receiving our supports. So cultural considerations. Um, there's a lot of things we want to think about when it comes to culture and understanding symptom presentation. Um, one is that symptoms might be described physically for a lot of reasons. You might hear about migraines, back aches, joint pains. Um, one could be because it's more socially acceptable to talk about physical pain. Um, and discussing physical pain gets me some medical support, right? Maybe not exactly what I need, but at least someone has their eyes on me and we're moving in the right direction. Um, it could be also that the person is just uh, experiencing their, their emotional pain in that way. Um, we might hear things like um, symbolism and things that we're not used to. So instead of saying, I have a sharp shooting pain, they may say, it feels like roots spreading through the ground. Um, it feels like drums going off in my head. It feels like spider webs spreading across my body. That's what the anxiety feels like. I say, when in doubt, operate from a position of curiosity. It is always better to ask questions until we understand than to make assumptions, right? So just continue to be comfortable with asking the questions and saying, help me understand what you mean by that. Is this what you meant? If not, please correct me. Um, the other thing to remember is that sometimes there are no words. There are some cultures where there are no words for depression. There are no words for anxiety. Um, in many cultures, it's either you're sane or you're mad, right? So who wants to raise their hand and say, I have madness, <laughs> you know, can, you, can you help me out with that? No one, right? So we need to be kind of open to this and um, really thinking about these things as we're interacting with people, open to exploration. One other thing, actually, one other thing I'll say about culture is that we also want to get an understanding of what they, their perception of their illness is, right? So do they think that this is an emotional issue, emotional illness? Do they think it's a brain issue? Is it of the body, the mind, or the spirit? Right? Sometimes people will tell me this is punishment for what I've done in the past. So um, understanding their perception is important because the way that we perceive things directly impacts the way that we respond. We want to understand what their perception is and make sure we're on the same play page so we move accordingly. All right, so trauma reactions and behaviors can look like all of these things if we don't have um, all the information, if we're not okay with asking the questions. So that's why it's important for us to get in that practice of asking until we understand. So it can look like ADHD, it can look like oppositional defiant disorder, it can look like learning disability, conduct issues, it can look like all these things um, if we're not getting the, the accurate information. All right, so I had an activity, but we're running short on time, so I think we'll just talk about it. Um, given what we've talked about so far and your experiences clinically, how do you think cultural identity um, impacts daily interactions for the folks that you're working with? All right, so getting to know the people you're working with, I think you can start by establishing that rapport and understanding who they are, where they're coming from, and you'll quickly know if this is a family that benefits from more of the medical information because they need to know like that it has to be grounded in this medical piece, or if I can you know, come at this from another perspective. All right, so a lack of trauma-informed care can have really negative outcomes for our families. Um, we can see, um, you know, them kind of struggling in adulthood with the ACEs if there's not um, trauma-informed care. We can see them showing up and really having um, cost increase on every system that we have. We can see them um, having uh, increasing costs for the education system. When I worked in school base, I worked really closely with the child study team and didn't always understand some of the decisions they made around supports. And I, and I would say, well, this is the kind of 
kind of school they need and then they tell me it costs ninety thousand dollars to send one child to this school you know because we have to cover the education and we have to cover the transportation that's one child right so all these things come up when our children aren't really getting what they need all right so we're going to quickly if I can click fast enough, <laughs> get to some of the stats. Um, but essentially, so in 2012, approximately 356, 300, uh, 356,268 inmates with severe mental illness were in prisons and jails, and about 35,000 severely ill patients were in state psychiatric hospitals. Most recently, in 2019, the Attorney General's Task Force um, of children exposed to com violence found that 90% of juvenile offenders in the U.S. have experienced a traumatic event in childhood. Um, essentially what all this data suggests is that um, our prison system is the largest uh, mental health provider because there's so many more people who are showing up there than in our hospitals, in our outpatient clinics, and etc. So the key point really is for us to remember that when we're when people are walking into our offices and our centers, we are really just seeing the tip of the iceberg. There is so much going on. Um, there's so much going on systemically. There's so much going on within their homes. There's so much going on culturally. Um, and we really want to be taking all that into consideration. Uh, one of the things I meant to mention earlier when we talked about that intersection of culture and trauma is that culture really impacts the way people perceive the event. So you could have two people, if one person has experienced a great deal of racism and discrimination because of their cultural identity, when something bad happens, it's not only that this happened, they're also wondering, is this, because, this, is this happening because of who I am, right? So there's all kinds of um, feelings of guilt and shame and responsibility that can go along with that um, when we talk about that intersection. So for folks who um, don't necessarily operate in that clinical role and sometimes get uncomfortable when they ask these questions, these are just some general guidelines that, you know, if you ask that question, have you been through some tough stuff? Um, have you lost anyone recently? Um, is, has anything happened that made you, made you feel unsafe? Um, you can start by empathizing. You know, you can start by showing some um, appreciation and respect for the fact that they trusted you enough to share that information. The next step is to gather information because whether you're going to treat them or not, you have to be able to give them a warm handoff and you want to be able to gather as much information as possible. So you want to know when these types of things happened, when did this behavior happen, who else knows, what kind of supports are there. If there are supports there that they haven't utilized, what's the barrier? What, how can we get everyone moving to support them? And then how, that survival piece, how have you gotten through it? How are you getting by day by day? So gathering that information. And then we want to start to consult and connect. You know, if this is something you feel really well versed in and you can do the work with them, that's amazing. Um, but if you can't, then you want to connect them with people you know of, people you trust, people who are offering um, approaches that are promising or at least um, or evidence based. Um, but we want to make sure that we do a quick and effective um, referral. So how do we get the trauma history? We can get it through um, doing the biopsychosocial. We can do it by um, asking questions and in informal interviews, or you can use formal screening. Um, like the Parenting Stress Index, the Trauma Symptom Checklist, there are a host of free resources out there um, that you can use. And we want to remember that when we're asking or when we're looking um, at different behaviors, we're not thinking what's wrong with this family. We're wondering what happened to them. Um, we're thinking about the fact that every, every time we see something, there's a reason why. There's a, there's a motivator. There's, um, these behaviors don't come from you know, nowhere. So our trauma-informed interactions. Again, we know that trauma is about that lack of predictability, lack of control, lack of safety. So we want to be aware of our tone of voice, um, body language, um, asking the right questions, um, getting back to our families pretty quickly so that they feel heard, uh, collaborating so they're not in a situation where treatment is being done to them, but they feel like they're engaged and they're um, an active participant. And of course, advocacy. Um, I think that I'm learning over the years that trauma work really is social justice work, right? So we have to get comfortable with that role of having to advocate for the people we're working with and getting them what they need. <coughs> All right, so creating a system that supports the work, um, there are two steps or two ideas. Um, the first is really, I'm, I'm thinking more about departments, right, because you're all in different departments. So your department should establish a mission statement that is very closely connected to Rutgers' core values. So a mission statement and a way of working that is aligned to accessibility for all, safety, respect, all those things that we hold to be very important. 
Um, and then part two is developing a structure for rollout. So I know, I'm sure you all know that change in large systems is tough <laughs> and it does not happen overnight. And a lot of um, what makes the change effective or not is the, the workforce. So if employees don't feel heard in that process, if messaging isn't consistent, then it's not going to work. So we have to think about um, how do we communicate? How do we communicate that this is who we are and this is the way that we work, that this isn't an add-on, it is just a part of our daily process. Um, are we communicating this in staff meetings for 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after? Do we have a concept of the month? Um, do we have staff input? Input, you know, it's really important, just like clients, for staff to feel heard and to see some of the changes they've suggested be put into place. Uh, we want to think about structural changes. When I've done some trainings with pediatricians, they'll say, you know, all this stuff sounds great, but I'm given 15 minutes to work with each family that comes in this clinic. When am I asking about all this stuff? So structurally, what do we do to support people to actually get the work done so it doesn't feel like a burden and it does feel just like a part of the work that we do daily? Um, as much as possible, having visual aids and supports around to remind staff, but also to remind the patients that you're welcome here. This is who we are. Um, and then creative ways to raise awareness. You can have um, campaigns, you can have contests among departments, uh, all kinds of strategies really just to drive it home and have it be just a part of our DNA, our identity as an organization. So signs of a culturally unsafe environment. A lot of what we're talking about is creating a system that feels both trauma-informed and culturally safe. So some signs that people aren't feeling safe are um, if they're not using our services. If they're showing up and we have you know, tons of services and, and resources, but they're just not committing yet. That could potentially be an issue. Um, if they're denying that there's a problem, if there's non-compliance with referrals or medication and interventions, um, unexplained anger and discomfort, um, issues around self-worth that they're deserving for you know of this type of support and help um, and then outright complaints about the lack of cultural appropriateness of what you're offering um, it could be a sign so um, there are five principles that are thought to support us in creating environments that feel culturally safe we can do that by protocols and pro by protocols I mean protocols for engagement who should I be talking to in this family it really depends you know it really changes across families I know when I worked in outpatient I was used to meeting with moms I was used to meeting with a lot of moms but when I worked with a Nigerian family the father told me I'm the person you contact I make the medical decisions and this kind of falls under my role in the family so we want to get a sense of who should I be talking to what are the rules around engagement how can I be respectful of that um, we want to have personal knowledge of our own stuff, and I think we need that in every part of our work. But who are we? Um, what aspects of our identity are important to us? And how does that impact the work that we do? We want to be very mindful and careful not to um, push our values onto others and really allow them to lead the treatment and identify the goals. We want to have partnerships. So we want um, the, the work to be collaborative, for the family to be heard, but also partnerships with people who are important to that family. It is not uncommon to pull in a religious leader or a, a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle. Whoever has the power to support our recommendations and, um, and move things forward should be included. Um, then we also want to have, uh, we want to be mindful about the process. We should be constantly checking in to make sure that treatment um, is in line and respectful of the family's values, um, of, of um, their perceptions of, of what they need. And then lastly, positive purpose. This has to end well for the family. You know, it has to be about um, what's important to them. It has to be about what their goals are. And there have to be concrete steps identified that they can take to reach um, the point that they hope to be at by the end. All right, so we also support... Um, we support trauma-informed and culturally safe environments by thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and that really should be incorporated in all of our policies. There should be diversity in the staff. There should be diversity in the people who are showing up for support. Um, so there used to be talk about equality. You know, everyone gets the same thing, but we're learning that equality um, doesn't necessarily help people. Because what a, you know, if you have two people and one person is here and one person is here, giving them the same thing doesn't put them on the same playing field. So we're thinking about equity, you know, that people get exactly what they need um, and then inclusion where people feel welcome not only to show up here but they feel welcome to thrive here okay so this is a saying that I found that diversity is where everyone is invited to the party equity means that everyone gets to contribute to the playlist 
but inclusion means that everyone has an opportunity to dance. And we want to think about how we can create and cultivate environments like this in our workplace. All right, so trauma, again, is about setting the predictability, um, creating predictability, creating safety, um, and really, I would say overall, creating corrective experience, okay? Restoring people's faith in people um, and, and in themselves. All right, so we're gonna talk about self-care. Oh no, we don't have time. All right, self-care is important. <laughs> um, but quickly, <laughs> and I'm sorry that it's last because it probably is the most important um, piece of this, but we know that if we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't guard against becoming burned out, then we will be. So make sure that you have support. You have a work tribe. You have a tribe outside of work um, that really supports you, helps you process the work that you're doing. Um, take care of yourself, but take care of one another. So the other thing that I've seen happen quite often is when we're working in these environments, we're like trading war stories. We're coming in like, here, this is what I went through today. This person did that. And we're not asking permission to share these stories. So Let's be mindful about our sharing. Let's take care of ourselves and each other. Um, if you find that you're struggling, take um, talk to your leadership, talk to people you care about, be okay with seeking professional help, and find opportunities to engage in self-care throughout your day. Self-care shouldn't be at the end of your day when you know nothing else is going on. It should be intentional and it should just be a daily practice. Um, this last note is from Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who is the Surgeon General in California. Um, and I think this sums it up really nicely. The single most important thing we need today is the courage to look this problem in the face and say this is real and this is all of us. We need each other to do this and it's all of our job. Thank you for your time.